Recovering Queen. The Queen Fan Podcast, where we talk about and play the songs we love. With Jay, Matt, and Ian. Welcome to Recovering Queen, a podcast where we record a famous and not so famous Queen track and then talk about what we've learned about the methods and madness of the greatest band of all time, Queen. My name's Ian, and with me, as ever, are Jay and Matt. Good Hello. evening. But but we were laughing and talking all the way through that at the start, was you did it. Is that how you want it to come out? <laughs> I'm immune to you now, so I can... It does get, seem like Ian's immune to us. <laughs> I, can get, I can get through it now. <laughs> no flinching at all. Yeah. Yes, welcome to the podcast. Jay, what, what song are we doing this mm. week? Uh, a, a song called 39. Or to give it its full title, Apostrophe. <laughs> 39. Yeah, I think that, that, yeah, that right? well, it denotes the year, that it's a year rather than just the number 39. Oh, you don't mean it. You don't mean an apostrophe, do you? Doesn't he? I don't think he does. What is it? What's it called? It's, 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 an, it's an apostrophe that's in the air. No, that, that's, you're that's thinking of high. a comma that's jumped high to become an apostrophe. <laughs> I am. I'm thinking of a comma. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> Thus ends the grammar lesson. All part of the service, listeners. Oh, oh brilliant. It's, it's, that's an excellent start then. Yes, I, I, was, I apologize. Your fact number one. This is the most startling mm. fact of all that I've only just discovered. 39 is Queen's 39th studio song. No. That mm. can't be true. It's true. <laughs> it, it, it actually is. It is true, mm. yeah. That is a great Queen fact. When I was listening to Night at the Opera the other day on the 45th anniversary of its release, I, I found where the placing order of 39 on the album, a curious position, the second to last track, or third to last if you count um, God Save the Queen. It just seemed that that was the wrong place for it, but not if it is in 39th position. Maybe that's it. Maybe they moved it there because they just couldn't resist the coincidence. Uh. But that would actually, I mean, genuinely, that probably would explain that, wouldn't it? Because I, 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 I agree. I don't think it's in a great position on the album. It's, it's in a position which a song of its stature really shouldn't be in. No. But I didn't finish my 39 uh, anecdote. No. What is your 39 anecdote? Apparently, and Matt, but you being the scientist uh, amongst, well, we're all <laughs> technically scientists, I <laughs> yeah, suppose. Same, but same degree as Ian. The, yeah, running the Interplanetary Society and so on. No. What do you do? You run the podcast. Yeah, I, I am a fellow of the British Interplanetary ah, Society. Well, there we go. <laughs> You'll be able to explain this better, but it's, it's something to do with there's a planet that's 39 degrees coming off Earth. Is it as you maybe as you raise up from the uh, the ecliptic? Uh, the, it's something to do with 39 degrees latitude. Well, no, well maybe, latitude. yeah, Nep- uh, not Neptune. Um, no, 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 it's not Neptune. It's supposed to be Mercury, and that's why it's 39. Really? It's the planet. Oh, so oh, oh, planet oh maybe, Mercury. maybe its rotational axis is 39 degrees. Well, that, I mean, that could, it that could be. That could, I mean, that, cer- that certainly makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I don't know what the connection between. I don't know if that's true. I just read it. But then, why would why would Brian make all these coincidences with thirty nine? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Why did he choose thirty nine? I don't know. As as in Mercury, as in Freddie Mercury, you did get. The yeah, I did there, obviously didn't you? get the connection. Right. I've always <laughs> I've got a joke about Freddie Mercury. You know the. Um, it must have must have occurred to Brian at the time when when they were driving around in the van early early Queen tour days. Was it the transit of Mercury? The great thing about that is you can just edit on like loads of yeah. applause, uh, well, or laughter. Sorry, laughter. Oh, laughter track, <laughs> but like sort of old musical laughter. Let's let, let's go through his time dilation theory then. What, what's uh, going on see, here? Now, uh, I'm glad you asked. Jay. <laughs> because I at, I actually took the time this afternoon to do the to do the maths. So I, I yeah I actually did the maths. So I went off and I heard an interview with Brian May, and he said it's a one year journey that takes a hundred years. So they leave in the year of thirty nine, and then they come back in the year of thirty nine, which is implicit in the song, sure. right? When yeah. you say they, you you mean astronauts? The astronauts, yeah, the people. astronauts on the ship that have left. They are explicitly the, astronauts. The score yeah. brave souls. The score it? brave souls inside the ship that yeah. leaves and the greatest sight they ever saw, all that kind of thing. So it's an experimental across rocket the ship across the Milky Seas. Across the Milky Seas, yeah. So it's an experimental rocket ship, and Brian says that he's 
it, the, the ship does a circular trajectory and comes back. And the people on board the ship, it's taken a year. And for people on Earth, it's taken 100 years, right? And if you do the maths, this is known as the Lorentz factor of 100. So it's, it, it's 100 times longer for the people watching them than the people on the spacecraft. So the Lorentz factor is 100. If you do the maths, that means that they must have been traveling at 99.995% of the speed of light to do that. And if that's the case, and this circle would have a radius of about 32 light years, which means that there's a planet... <laughs> There's a sorry. There's a star system called Gliese three five seven, which has a super Earth in the habitable zone. So you could actually take that in on this exact journey if you had a spacecraft that was capable of getting up to that speed instantaneously and stopping instantaneously when it got back to Earth. No way. Which of course is never the case. Wow. But yeah, so it's it's feasible. Yeah. But ninety nine point nine nine five percent of speed of light is is pretty pretty insane. That's amazing uh, calculations that you carried out there, Matt, for, for the sake of science. <laughs> for the sake of the body. You know. There's a score brave souls inside, so that's 20 people are on board, plus, plus the weight of the, the, um, the vessel. So how much energy <laughs> does it need to do this journey? <laughs> uh, well, getting anything up to 99.995% of the speed of light, I reckon, is is an extraordinary amount of energy. This is where you have to talk, start talking about Alcubierre drives and stuff like that, which which here's a, here's a really good point about the song. The century that it's in isn't specified. So apostrophe 39 could be 2239, could be 2139, could be 2039, could be 20, you know, 2439 so it's yeah. uh, so mm. he hasn't actually specified what that is but haven't you noticed that it's that it's almost the exact plot of interstellar and there's there's is there's really? some amazing coincidences which i can't believe there isn't more fuss about it because there's things like um this this whole idea of time dilation and coming back and seeing your granddaughter well obviously in interstellar he goes off he has time dilation although the time dilation is caused by gravitational bending of space time rather than time dilation through uh, velocity by change of inertial frame but the but that's similar. He sees his he sees his daughter as an old woman, and then um, the other one is uh, letters through the sand, and that sand in Interstellar where he's like in that prism thing, and he's and he's c communicating with her through the sand. Mm. And I'm thinking, but, how was how has no one picked that up as a kind of <laughs> theme of yeah. of, of in Interstellar and thirty nine being unbelievably connected like that oh, absolutely and and the, the double bass is really good in it as well isn't it <laughs> double bass is actually ace it's really really good <laughs> the double bass is good <laughs> well, didn't, uh, didn't john surprise brian in the studio that brian asked for it to be on double bass but john at that time couldn't really play it or didn't have one but then the next time he was in there he, he turned up with one and and that's the version we know and love. I believe it, it came down to a bet. Brian may bet John Deacon that he couldn't play it perfectly in tune in one take and lost the bet. John Deacon played it right the way through one take. No way. That's Bang. Fantastic. Did it a couple of days after hmm. making the bet and everyone went, oh my God. So obviously the lyrics are quite... Um, well, interesting, complicated, and slightly melancholic. Obviously, the the final verse um, certainly, but the song itself is so upbeat and such a joy. It's like a real kind of country and western hoedown where everyone's having a real blast. I was introduced through this through Live Killers, and the version on Live Killers is just absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a skiffle song, isn't it? Really, and I think Brian's described it as skiffle. And Rogers described it as sci-fi. I thought he described folk. it as sci No, Roger. I thought it was sci-fi folk. No, that was Roger. Sci-fi yeah, folk? Yeah, Roger describes it as sci-fi oh. folk. But yeah, it's... Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I think musically it's got some fantastic elements to it as well. The way that, that the that middle section is sort of cut up and used at the beginning. And it's got a kind of weird sci-fi element to the middle section and the in the intro with the Rogers very high voice that's sort of reminiscent of Star Trek almost. And it's and and, and yeah. yet it's yeah, and yet it stays yeah. 
it stays really folky at the same time. So it's it's a really innovative bit of music. I mean, it may actually be one of Brian's best kind of harmonically structured songs. It's absolutely brilliant. The middle well, section. Certainly the introduction and the middle section, the chords are just all over the place and some of them just have absolutely no place to be in there in the context of the verse and the chorus, which are just fairly obvious and fairly, fairly folky stuff. But those, those middle eights, it's just bizarre, absolutely bizarre harmonies going on. Yeah, but I think that is the out-of-world thing, isn't it? Yeah. That's what he's trying to do. In- interestingly, I think, I think I had about three or four requests for 39. It came through quite strongly, which I thought was quite weird, seeing as we're just about to Hugely do Hugely popular. Certainly um, mm. chatting about Night at the Opera's 45... 45- 45th anniversary a couple of weekends ago there was a lot of love for 39 everyone saying it was their you know their favorite queen song or certainly that and profit song were, were, were two that people yeah were i know but you about. think about how many songs queen have done i was quite surprised that people were zeroing in on th- i mean i love 39 i think it's a fantastic song but i was quite surprised that people maybe they were sort of getting the fact that we were doing some uh hidden gems i don't know is it hidden gem I, it's it's a sort of semi hidden gem isn't it it's a gem in the rough isn't it because even May, he, Brian May himself, really, I think 39 is probably Brian May's favourite song that was never released as a single. Yeah. I.e., it, it's, it's, it, he's got a massive soft spot for it. It's been a live staple for the entire time that it's been written. It's never been dropped, presumably, for, as, a, as one of their well, big live you, songs. You, you say Ooh. that. Yeah, you say that. So <laughs> here we it go. Was, here um, we go. comes in. <laughs> it was introduced to the set in um, summer '76. First played in Edinburgh, but then summarily dropped from the set in um, oh crikey, when was it? '79 at the the final performance as as Queen Queen um, was at Hammersmith on the 26th of December '79. Then it got a couple of introduction plays, little teasers. But you're right in a sense, Matt, that it's now being well introduced back into the set and Brian May's played it a lot solo. Yeah. Well, so they didn't do it on things like the Works Tour and no, the Magic Tour? No, oh, it, got, wow. it got got one performance in 1980 after, at, uh, but that, that was just a kind of a teaser introduction to it. No, it never did, wasn't, wasn't played again. But it, it was played a lot i think over 200 performances just between you know 76 and, and um end of 79 yeah i mean the live killers version is a beauty isn't it oh it's absolutely fantastic okay. and roger doing those um harmonies live as well it, his voice is so high it's oh, yes yeah. yeah it's unbelievable how high he sings on it it's, well, it's yeah. really lovely to hear Freddie as well in, on backing vocals. It's like it's like you don't ever get to hear Freddie and you know just playing that role as the backing vocalist, but it's actually really nice. And and I, I think we've spoken about it before, haven't we? It's it's just so lovely to hear Brian sing the lead, to hear Roger sing the lead. Has John ever sang a lead? <laughs> no. no, John. <laughs> John, uh, John, there was there was some rumor that when John tried to do backing vocals, the stage collapsed or something. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Did, well, did yeah. you start that rumour? <laughs> yeah, I just started it just now. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you know what I like about 39? Uh, I like many things about it, but it's, well, actually, maybe this is more the album that I like. Because it seems to me that they're really flowing now in terms of, we say this is a folk song, but you look at the album and they're, they're, they're really trying so many different styles and they're mastering all of them, I would say. I guess you could say Sheer Heart Attack, its predecessor, did the same. But I kind of think that they've gone one up. I think this is almost like the peak of where they're doing really diverse styles and really mastering all of them. I think Night at the Opera, you know, absolutely, Night at the Opera, considering the circumstances around it, which obviously we cover on Death on Two Legs, but that that the circumstances around their management and the fact that they couldn't even see their label... And they're they're all they're all working in different studios. They're under a lot of pressure. There's lots of depression around because it's like we don't even know whether we, 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 this is going to get sorted out. So there's lots of kind of issues. Yet they're all really really writing, and there's a lot of competition in the camp. And obviously, Freddie's eclectic songwriting has really blossomed. Kind of influenced. Yeah, well, well, I mean, Freddie's obviously blossomed, but it's, it's it's also had a massive effect on Brian May, and Brian's, you know, desperate to kind of keep up with Freddie and and do all these really interesting 
mm. uh, uh, different genres. I mean, does trad jazz on on on, on there as well? <laughs> and uh, you know, he's all over the shop. Here's a question for you, Ian. When you were doing your version, because we should say that this version is quite is one of our versions that k- sticks quite. Um, Quite a yeah, lot you don't to want the to original. mess around with 39 no, too no, much, exactly. do you? It's, a bit, it's one of the sacred songs, really, isn't it? The one thing I've noticed is that the choruses are all different. Yeah, uh, that's one thing that took me a bit by surprise. So I got it all totally wrong first time round and just sang. I think I was singing the first, ver- the first chorus from Live Killers the first time. But it does change subtly. So I had to go back and, and redo various bits and pieces here and there. And I still think the, the version, I'm still working on the version. Uh, what key is it in, Ian? Um, I think it's D major. Ah, uh, I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice, uh, re- relatively nice and, and easy to play. Uh, it gets a bit tricky in the middle bits. But the hardest part it is not being able to replicate Roger's voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you just can't get anywhere near it. It's it's beyond what people can sing. You know, it's like Ma- 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 Mariah Carey kind of highness of the voice. It's astonishing. The, the track sounds like they're having fun. You know, it, it's, it's, it's great, isn't it? But yeah. h- here's a question for you, Ian, with the lyric. Is this this one in the same way that Roger Taylor has his trilogy of The Outsider? Mm. May has a very much a theme across a lot of his songs, which is about being away from home and being lonely. Well, there's definite sense of melancholy across the whole song, despite its, you know, joyful bounce to it. It is a deeply sad song. You can read the you know the time dilation story or you can read it yeah you might not even notice that and you can think it's just about travelers coming home and you know things have changed however you want to do it but on a more kind of allegorical level it's almost about any journey isn't it whenever you return from any journey you've changed and the place you come back to has changed as well so there's always that kind of you can never really go on a journey and then return in a way and i suppose brian at the time he's only just back from his illness as well isn't he so he's probably not feeling 100% or he's either feeling amazing because he's not ill anymore. I think it's actually the latter. I think I think in by the time he's got to I think he is a grateful that he's not ill anymore and still got a job in Queen. You know, he could have quite easily have been replaced. Yeah, he could have been. Well, not easily obviously, but he, he you know, may have found himself in that situation. Yeah. And um and yes, yeah, so, and he's and he's working hard and the songs are coming. They must have known that they had an absolutely awesome album on their hands. Well, sorry, what was wrong? Did he have Tetsy Fly or something? What was it? Uh, hepatitis. And that was yeah. part of the circumstances of the the tensions with Trident as well, because a number of um, tours, was it the US tour or the Japanese tour that was pulled short because of his illness and I think there were some um, London shows as well that they were going to film at great expense and had to be pulled at again short notice and at great expense obviously because uh, Brian was too ill to perform. If you listen to a song like 39 it's absolutely great isn't it it's lyrically spot on I actually think that 39 is a great lyric yeah because he manages to bring in a pretty good <laughs> piece of special relativity. <laughs> Not many people have done that in a song. <laughs> no. He's car- he's carried on the tradition of, say, David Bowie and Stanley Kubrick, who, who were doing this lonely spaceman thing. So that was the zeitgeist at the time. He's doing it in a really unusual, folky way. He's got this crazy middle section, like you said, which is really harmonically very, very interesting. And there's just so much about that song that's just great. And the actual guitar riff on the 12 string guitar is one of the sort of best 12 string guitar riffs ever. It's so yeah. great. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah, Good. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. And, you know, you, even if you just take away the lyrics and you don't have the, the you know, the, almost the three strands because there's a spiritual going on a journey kind of. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, the, yeah. The, the lyrically, well. I think it's brilliant. I think it's, it's really brilliant. good. Yeah. But, but take all that away from it and just put some stock lyrics on there. You've got an absolute banging tune. A real oh, yeah, yeah. Up, a fantastic mm. chorus, brilliant verse. It is, it's up there with his very best work and the very best work of Queen. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's clever as well, isn't it? The chorus is so unusual because the, the, the melody swaps between the choir and the lead vocal. Yeah. So it's like the, the choir start the chorus and then it goes into a lead vocal. And then that last section where it sort of comes down an octave and then goes back up an octave all in 
this kind of counterpoint, like three part harmony that that is never the same on any of the choruses. It's absolutely, yeah, yeah. Br- it's brilliant. I mean, it's really, really good. So what an amazing week we've had uh, launching uh, the podcast and a lot of you have got in touch. We had a few good shout outs. We would like to say thank you to John Richardson and the Future Noughts who do an excellent podcast on the future. Uh, well worth downloading and listening to that. They gave us uh, a very nice review. It was a really big thumbs up, wasn't it? Massive thumbs up. A really big thumbs up from John and the guys. <laughs> Thanks for that. Because we, we both know when he's incredibly sarcastic and rude, we know that that really is denoting a lot of love. Yeah, what he actually means to say Ex- exactly. is, is he loves it, but, but that's his way of saying it. Yeah, it was good to get. It was good to get yeah. mentioned. It was really good. Yeah, the more the, the more rude he is, the the more he likes what uh, what people are yeah, doing. Exactly, that's how we're reading it anyway. <laughs> and of course, the people that have got in touch with us on Twitter, giving us their opinions on various Queen songs and uh, the various versions that we've done. So that's a big shout out to Husey Boy and uh, Pete Uh. So thanks for getting in touch, uh, chaps. We uh, hope you. Uh, Remain in touch. If you want us to do any Queen cover, just email us and give us the reason why you might want us to do that Queen cover, and we and we'll see if we can get it slotted into the um, schedule, and we'll give you a massive shout out. That's a really good idea, but but please don't choose Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> <laughs> so yes if you want to get in touch get in contact with us via info at recoveringqueen.co.uk or go to at recovering q on twitter and engage with us there thank you very much for listening it's been an awesome first week for us and here is 39 <laughs> For my life still ahead, pity me, 